Welcome back. I'm Rob Lang and this is my game Clomper. You live inside a mechanical ladybird called a Clomper, which you control by making pipes to power machines with steam. The outside world is a hellscape, which you explore from inside the Clomper, gathering resources and completing quests. That sounds like fun. Go wishlist on Steam. In this devlog, we're going to look at the plan, the filters and the scrap. Hold on to your hats, there's a lot to get through. Here's the plan, but how far through are we? Well, I put legs on the clomper. I then set up a Steam page. Go wishlist. Did a playtest with Evil Matt and Big Rob and that went well. I then added the Unity input system, changed all the controls over and added a bunch of menus. I then had a choice. I could either go up and do some weather stuff, which I really want to do, or put in an inventory, which would allow a whole new sort of game mode, picking up scrap, spending scrap. It's like the survival element. And I chose the inventory down here at the bottom. So what about weather? Well, we're going to ignore that for the moment and talk about what the next steps are. The next thing I want to do is change the way the claw works. Do an alpha test, which is internal with friends, and then a beta test, which will involve some of you rapscallions out there in the community, leading to a Steam evolving demo. I've stolen the term from Thomas Sala, who made Falconeer and is currently making Bulwark on Steam. Thomas Sala was the first person I saw use the term. The general idea is, is you have a freely downloadable demo up on Steam and people can download it and give you feedback. You then change the demo and upload it. It's still a narrow slice of the game. It's not the full content, but there should be enough there for people to give you meaningful feedback. So it's kind of like a beta test because you're going out to the community to do so, but it's still a demo. I think that's a really good idea. And for Clomper, particularly so. So much of the content can be added later. New map tiles, new pipes, new quests. Now at this point, I'm not going quite as fast as I'd like to. So I have to be a bit more ruthless with features and I'm cutting where possible. And I'm afraid that means for the moment, I won't be doing weather. That makes me really sad because I think that would be brilliant fun, but that will have to be added into the evolving demo. I introduced the inventory in the last video. So if you want a bit more detail about how I arrange all the pipes, please check back there. Look how short my beard is. You can see how long it has been between the two devlogs by the length of my beard. I think generally we should just start measuring time by the length of my beard. Let's get rid of all these hours and minutes and seconds. It's nonsense. Last time I tried to record this, there was a bug slap dab right in the middle of this nonsense. <laughs> so irritating. So here we are in the inventory as it is now. I've added in WASD movement so you can navigate up and down and around through the inventory and the scroll wheel is still there. I've not put the mouse pointer in yet. I'll probably do that in the future. But and honestly, I've gone so fast through these different pipes with WASD that it works a treat. And there are key binds too. It's always best to do the key binds as you go along rather than all at the end. Otherwise, you'll forget some, miss some, and it's just a horrible thing that you'll probably leave out and cut. The eagle-eyed will notice that I've now got a 3x3 grid of pipes rather than a 4x4. 4x4 would have been okay, but as soon as you start putting all of the text on the grid, it starts looking really crowded. To steal from UX, let your components breathe. So what are filters? Well, let's pretend for a moment that you don't have five pipes, you have hundreds of them and you have a problem that you're trying to solve in the clomper and you don't really know which pipe it is you want but you can kind of describe it by other things. That's what filters are for. Narrowing down your search until you find the thing that you want. I've put the filters over on the left hand side. They're all those slightly ugly dials that I'm going to fix in the future but not just yet. Not yet. The first filter is the number of ports on a pipe. Now the ports are the number of holes. As you can see here, the filter shows star, which means any number. But if I select two, it will show me all of those pipes with only two ports, three only with those with three ports and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, there are no matching pipes for those. So I get this subtle text just informing me there may not be any pipes that match those criteria. For size, much the same deal. I'm actually using the longest length. Both the unit pipes, the valve and the unit have the size of 111, nice and easy. And as we go up, 
we can see that different pipes have different longest lengths. Now I think that's probably the nicest way of doing size. I could put three different filters on there and let people search for length, width and height. I think I'm going to leave that and see how people feel in the future. The interactive switch, which is perhaps the ugliest model I've ever made in my life, lets us see which pipes have switches or dials or anything that's remotely interactive on them. There's only two at the moment but I imagine there's going to be a lot more of these. And I hate that switch. I mean it moves alright but <laughs> yeah. It's going to get fixed. Next is the resource cost. It will show you any pipes that are that amount of resources or less. So if I select one resource, then there's no pipes that are one resource or less. The first one is the unit that is five resources and you can keep going up and it will show more and more. Now I've not tuned any of the costs. All of the values that you see on here are just for experimentation. None of this is balanced yet. I'll do that in the future video because you love a spreadsheet. I know you do. I've made two kinds of dial, a horizontal and a vertical. Now that might seem obvious, but they're very slightly different use cases. So for example, on the horizontal dial, you don't really have a zero, a one, and so on and so forth. It starts at star, and the next one is two, then three, then four, then five, and so forth, up until nine, and then it cycles round again. And that's because I'm not planning to put a pipe in that only has one port. Size is using the same horizontal dial with the same number of faces, but I can imagine increasing this because you may want to have pipes that are 10 or 11 long, or at least say nine or more. <laughs> the, this little resource image here is floating. I'll fix that. For a vertical dial, I need to show a number which could be many digits long. You can see over here on the side that I've got ones, tens, one hundreds, a thousands, and I've turned them off, but it can go higher still. The value of the dial is also set quite differently. Whereas before, up on size, I can just rotate the dial, and whichever value it is next is the one that's going to be on the dial. But I can't really do that for cost, because I've got to tell it I'm going up to 300 now. So if I go up to some big value, I want anything that's 699 or less, then I've got to tell it 699. And that means I have to set the ones to nine, the tens to nine, and the hundreds to six. If you would like to see how I coded all of that, then please pop along to the Discord and ask, and I'll try my best to explain it. Link down in the description. The next thing that I've done, and you've probably already spotted this, is scrap. Now I'm starting here with the scrap thermometer because last time I said this. Whether I include this dial that tells you exactly how much or whether I have a thermometer that gives you an idea of how much, I'm not sure. Now clearly that was quite wrong as you all rightly pointed out. People like to see numbers. I get it. It's fine. However, this here is the original scrap thermometer and I'm keeping this. It's nice for having a quick glance if you're off somewhere across the room and you just want to glance over to see where your scrap is at before you make some changes, but it's not going to give you the detail that you need to choose pipes. So for an example, I'm going to give myself a thousand scrap, come out of photo mode, which is brilliant for devlogs, absolutely love it. Pop into the inventory, you can see in the top right hand corner now we have the amount of scrap that we have, which is 1000. If I start putting pipes down, then it will change. And now we see inside the inventory we only have 685. That's because the switches are quite expensive. If I keep laying them down, you'll notice that the pipes I can no longer afford go grey on the tool. Let's see that work. So the switch is now greyed out, so I can't afford a switch. I can select it, but you can see in the top of the tool that there is this icon spinning. So I'll keep going. And if I put that one down, then I can't afford anything now. If I then delete the pipe, I get some scrap back so I can then place some more pipes. The little logo by the side of the scrap is the ruined scrap icon. That's kind of like cash or currency and I'm going to put that anywhere where there is some kind of action that gives you or uses up scrap. <laughs> this world's a mess. Let's start a new game. <laughs> oh, 
I'm completely professional. So where does all this scrap come from? Well, it won't surprise you to know that it's littered around the world and you'll go and collect it using this process. Grab the scrap, lift it up so it's all the way to the lift, switch on the lift, lower the lift. And you'll see the scrap will disappear up into the lift. And then we can raise the lift and there we have our scrap, but that's not quite usable yet. We have to grind it into something useful, which is this doohickey over here. Switch on the grinder. Grab a bit of scrap. Stick it in the grinder and your scrap increases. All right, you're skeptical, I know. I'll prove it to you. We start off at 7745. I'm gonna come over here grab a new piece of scrap, pop it in the grinder. Once it completes, 7755. That's not a lot of scrap for your effort, so I'm gonna balance all of that. It's just numbers at the moment. Next up, I'm going to put scrap into the world. Now, for those who don't know, the world is procedurally generated out of tiles. You can see me clicking on them here reveals each kind of tile. So for each tile, I'm going to choose the places on the tile where I want the scrap to spawn. And I could have 10 or 15 places on each tile and the game would randomly choose from them. It can then rotate the scrap, but otherwise put it pretty much where I specify. Now I could write some clever maths to do it. You can see these tiles are quite simple, but eventually they might be more complicated. And so it'd be very difficult to do. And yes, it is laborious me having to go through each tile and work out where I want to put the scrap, but I think it's the safest method. Once I have scrap in the environment, I'm then going to balance all of the numbers. So how much pipes cost and how much you get for each piece of scrap that you pick up. To balance the economy, I'm thinking of using one of three tools, either a spreadsheet, which will have all the pipes in it and do a bunch of calculations, or I could use a Jupyter notebook. And these are sort of a mix of code and data analytics. I also really like this game modeling tool, Machinations. Now, Sam Yam has already done a fantastic job of reviewing this, so I put her video down in the description. It's brilliant, check it out. What am I probably going to choose? I don't know. What tools do you like for game balancing? I'm really keen to hear. I'm concerned that there's one that I'm missing that will just nail this problem. I've now got 204 wish lists on Steam. Now I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but personally, given that there's no demo, there's no release date, it's unfinished, that's a lot of people who have put faith in me, so thank you all. And if you fancy wishlisting it, then there's a link down in the description, because of course there is. That's all for now. Do join us on Discord, like if you like it, subscribe if you want more, and until next time, bye bye. This has been quite an epic task getting this video together because you need to understand that there are a few different me's that go into making it. Firstly there's the planning me. Planning me did his work a week and a half ago, goes through all the notes, goes through the commits, the code, works out what story I might tell. Planning me is diligent, serious, focused, the kind of me that you'd invite to meet your grandmother, but you wouldn't invite to a party. So next is, is like the recording me. Uh, that's the me that's talking to you now. Slightly nervous, very self-conscious, not liking the sound of my own voice. I know that might sound weird to many of you watching this for the ASMR, but it just still freaks me out. Trying to get a lot of the points out that the planning me has worked so hard to write down and I will miss things that planning me has put in because this is unscripted I could script this also trying to do it without too many edits without fluffing any of my words and i'll probably fluff the word bluff now i think i'm better than planning me i'm definitely the kind of person that you might want to go down the pub with after recording comes edit me that's a rob that's a day or two in the future edit me will be tired after a long hard day at work and the house won't be quiet. Edit me probably will have had a beer and he just wants to get on with coding clomper at that point. He'll be sick of looking at his own face in the past because edit me hates 
recording me. This me now is going to be absolutely hated by the me in a couple of days time. And he will be upset that the recording me didn't manage to get the narrative or the flow that planning me had worked so diligently to put together. Edit me looks down on me because he's so much funnier than any of the rest of us. He has time to breathe and look at all the footage and write snarky comments about things. Then there's the pre-upload me. He's the me that watches the video back a day and a half after the edit. He is a knob.